me. The Society was founded in New York in 1875, and this lodge was founded, San Francisco Lodge was founded on August 10th, 1901. And we have three avowed objects to form a nucleus of the universal hood, brotherhood and sisterhood without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color, encourage the comparative study of religion, philosophy, and science, and investigate the unexplained laws of nature and the powers latent in sentience throughout the Federation of Planets and beyond. We take a few liberties with the three of our objects. <laughs> so, um, but that's what they are in essence. And we're very happy and honored today to be uh, conducting an interview, an online interview with Dr. Nicola Amadora. And we're going to talk about her new book, Love Unleashed, How to Rise in a World on the Edge. And um, Nicole, Nicola, welcome. Thank you so much for having me here. It's an honor. And I'm really glad that my book gets to be in your bookshelf there. It, it will be in it will <laughs> be in the library and we'll we'll have you sign a copy someday. I would love that. <laughs> when you're when you're when you're in the in the area. So um we're gonna have more of a a uh, conversation, uh, an organic conversation between Nicola and I, rather than uh, uh, you know, a kind of a formal interview. But we wanted to start, uh, Nicola. Uh, in the lodge, we love to hear people's stories, how they came, because you know, we, we all said we you don't come, you don't find a place like this. Uh, you 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 went you end up here because you had a journey and that journey led you to this place and and this encounter so we always love to hear uh people's stories uh of their journey anything you want to share about it um uh, revelations uh, uh in inspirations um vectors anything and uh, then from there we'll we'll go and talk a little bit about your book Let's hear well, about I, I I could fill I could fill the next five hours with lots of, of stories, you know. Of course. <laughs> and you wouldn't get bored by it. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna you know I also understand. Um, I'm gonna pick just one or two to keep it really. Give a feeling for it. Yeah. Yes, and what comes now to my heart, even though many stories, one of them that's not in the book is when I was in the wilderness in New Mexico. And I had the good fortune that I had a friend who had a horse farm and he allowed me to take one of his horses, an Arabian white, into the wilderness. I had this crazy dream of going into the wild and just the animals, the wilderness. I'm a mystic, yeah. So I went for a whole month just fasting and drinking water from the rivers and um, with my horse. And I had a deep, deep longing to be complete, to experience not just to know oneness and connection, but also um, to really deeply experience it. This was my cat, by the way. <laughs> She she always joins the interviews. It's, What's her name? That's Lakshmi. <laughs> She's a talking cat. And I I was craving for that, you know, that deep felt in the body experience of what oneness really is and this connectedness that many people are hungry for these days. Um, so I went out and, well, of course, as a European, being in the wilderness, it sounded like a great dream, but that is not so easy. And I was definitely challenged, you know, first of all, you know, the fasting, but then also um, suddenly I just encountered bears and coyote came to my camp and the owls and it was 
really beautiful. I slept underneath, so just I didn't have a tent. I slept in my sleeping bag. And one night I wake up and there is a coyote just on my face beginning to lick me. I wasn't sure if he would bite or if he would. So he began to lick me. And every night he showed up at the camp. So he became kind of a companion who traveled along and then his tribe followed too. We kind of set, we seemed to have the same path, even though there was no set path. And what I experienced more and more as I went really deep inside and sensed the nature as a living communion of the divine. And I was praying pretty much nonstop and in meditation. So it wasn't a sightseeing tour, it was a deep communion and a listening and an attunement. And after a while, it was like as if the veils began to drop. And there, I could feel, I suddenly could hear the animals, their language. I could understand the wind. It was not just a howling, but it had a voice. It had the song of the divine in it. I could sense the, where there was a river and I could hear a deeper song that came directly from the earth. And of course, <clears throat> what we can call the great mother. It was a soul song. And after a while, I was in such deep communion that I literally, I rode my horse or I walked as being one. And everything felt completely natural. It wasn't, there was no more separation. It was an exquisite joy. And of course, there, there's also pain that came of what we have done to our beautiful planet and all the creatures. And I could also sense that she was, she's everything. She's the, of course, we can read that in a, in a book. We can know that. But to really sense it in my cells, in my hands, in and and listening to all the different sounds and songs that emanated from the land and all the beings was to me such a blessing because after that when i came out of it into the world it was a shock to enter back into the world because i was like i was just in well, there were moments I was in rapture and there were moments I was in pain and there were moments, there's a lot of feelings that moved through as if the all creation was moving through me. Um, and I came into the world back to the streets, to the cars, to the noise, and it was a shock. And at the same time, the challenge was how do I not keep it, but how do I live this in the world without losing that sense of connectedness? That took some adjustment and a feeling into where is the song? Where is the, where is the, where is the sound of the divine? Where is the felt sense that <clears throat> emanates also through us here sitting together and everybody listening? Um, and it gave me, it, it, it took some adjusting, and then it gave me such a deep peace, even in the world. And it wasn't, I realized it wasn't about becoming free of the suffering, but being free in the midst of all the suffering that's going on. Uh, and of course, I could talk more about that, but that's too much for today. I, I just felt also such a deep love because in that moment I could feel, yeah, it's all included. Every single experience is included and every face on this planet, every being, and it's really in the body, it's here. So I um, this is just a small snippet of, of a taste. Beautiful. 
beautiful place to start. And um, it reminds me, it, 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 it's sort of a, a segue into the book. First of all, uh, did you say it was a white horse? Yes. Yes. Because so, I noticed the white horses on your uh, on your hold up your book for folks. Uh, the white horses on the cover. Now we have some context for I mean, <laughs> archetypal, of course, but now we have some context, life context for that image. And yes. Then it struck me um, in your uh, in the opening to your book, you describe an encounter that you had uh, at Mount Shasta, at the base of Mount Shasta. You, you yes. Wanna- Tell that story. Tell that story. Well, it, that's how the book really began because yeah. I was always a writer, but I never had time. And then I sat in Mount Sh- at Mount Shasta, and I literally because I could feel we are in these times of the great turning, and we are in we're on the edge, really. I mean, everybody who has some eyes to see can notice that. And I asked, really, with all sincerity how can I be of greater service in our world? Because I was already teaching for many years and I was already, you know, working with people. And But I felt like it, it just wasn't enough. I couldn't reach enough people. And then came the message, write for all of life. You know, write, write, a, write a book that will is about love, but not in a conceptual way. And... I was like, okay, all right, I don't have any time. Give me some confirmation if this is really on. And in that moment, because it was dark already, I heard footsteps behind me. And I I was like, ha, huh, who is that? Because I was alone there. So, but before I could turn around, there was a wet touch on my shoulders. And it was summertime, you know, so I had a thin T-shirt on. And I just could feel I mustn't move right now. And my all my hairs went up. And then slowly, whoever that, whoever it was, it turned around. And then I looked, and it was this gorgeous stag. And I, I could feel this was the confirmation. It was a blessing of... You know, the animals to say, yes, please write. And from there on, I took all the scrap paper I had and I started writing. And I had so many, you know, I've been on the path since now 40 years. And when the book came, you know, I started feeling like, man, this is so much what I could write. And I remember that I got always a little bit bored with these conceptual books. They, they write about it, how we could, how we should see things, how it's all like love and blah, blah. And when I heard I should write about love, I realized that now I was cringing because I was like, oh man, not that. Of course, my path is about love, but you know, the conceptual way how we phrase it, I, I just couldn't write another spiritual book with just some concepts and philosophies, even though they are important. And then I got the, the the impulse to make to write it very alive, to bring a lot of stories in it, to bring many angles into it where there's wisdom teachings, there's the love and action part where you can learn some practices. And there's a lot of stories woven into it, true stories to me or from other people that I could feel was like, and there's some poetry a little bit on it too. And I felt like this can actually, so that it is really a transformation whilst you're reading it, that it's alive. And it also has, you know, some solid grounded spirituality in it. So it's like, of course, it has some conceptual content in it as well. Um, and then I was sitting with the problem <laughs> You know, as I think this is a writer's problem. We write too much. <laughs> I had to, I was like, the beginning was like 800 pages. Okay. So way too much. And somebody said, write four books. I'm like, no, it has to be in one book. And so the first part is really about life, 
you know, and then about love. And then comes the second part, which leads into for you, just for, um, you know, that's like, you know, how you experience to feel more loved and connected, for example, and follow your calling. That's so important in this time. And then the third part is about the relational part, which I feel we have kind of failed in our world to get our relations, um, get ourselves, you know, equipped skillfully to be able to um, bring forth more loving relationships, not just with your partner, but with each other. And the fourth part then I got going was like, has includes, you know, voice, the voice of the earth, the service rocks the world and women rising. So that, and loving humanity so that it has like an overarch and you can read each chapter that stands on its own as well. Like you can read some for the spiritual path. You can just read the first, first part, you know, or whatever calls you. So you can pick up the book any time of day and just read a chapter and it might just speak to you on that particular day. So I felt like it's a real, it's based, it's like you can't exclude one part of from this book. I just couldn't cut it into pieces. Mm -hmm. The wholeness, it's a symphony. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Which leads us to um, behind it all. So, uh, the path of Mary Magdalene, the way of Mary Magdalene, um, the mysteries of all of that, what it means to you, um, how you're working with it, um, how it arrives for you, all of that. And, and, and of course, uh, the ascendancy of the feminine itself, which is, uh, something that I've written and spoken a lot about and is uh, central really to everything for us. Um, so if we can go into yeah. that, let you go yeah. into that. Yeah, it's a, I love this question and this, this contemplation on it because I feel at this time, you know, when I, the book was titled How to Rise in a World on the Edge, and it's not specific only about the feminine, but it definitely comes from the feminine because at this time where we are in the great turning, we need a much more feminine approach to everything, which is God is not in the heaven just, it's also the divine. She is this earth, she is your body. And um, because we have had this enormous division of there is the transcendence and basically you go on a mountaintop and you become enlightened. But for me, it's really about enlightenment. That's, I raised that coin a long time ago. It was just like, it doesn't really resonate. This enlightenment, you go away. But no, the full embodiment is the feminine. She comes into form and therefore, is a different relationship with all of life that's much more, much more loving and, and caring and respectful and just feeling, you know, every creature is sacred. Everything is sacred, is her. And for me, I, I was trained in um, Buddhism and Hinduism and mystic Christianity and many other um, traditions really deeply. I immersed myself, but it wasn't until I really, the feminine took me a whole other story about it, but it was where it came to really a pinpoint was, was then with Mary Magdalena. I was like, oh my God, there was nothing written about her at that time that you could find online. Um, it was just like that woman lived it full on. She lived the feminine in a time when the women were completely disregarded and were, you know, 
suppressed by the patriarchy and the structures and everything. So she became like my patron saint, and if you want to say. But also what spoke to me, the longer I was with her, it was because I'm on this on mystical path, which is really from the direct experience. Right. I, I could feel, wow, she's a full bloody mystic. And she kicks butt as well. She wasn't just the angel that floats around. <laughs> she's the kind of being of the feminine face where... I would say she can really kick butt and she set some fire under your heart and you know it's it's like it wakes she wakes up and what is dead in people what is disconnected and what is repressed or what has been you know silenced for so long so she's kind of a revolutionary and I feel at this time, that's what I also described in the book, is like we, we need the feminine in whatever relation you may anybody has to the feminine. We need her right now. We have to connect in ways that will bring forth a thriving world if we want to live on it. Um, and there is such a de depth of mystery that I got so enthralled by because I was like, oh my God, this has been buried for centuries. And, and this deep lineage that is the mother line that goes back, you know, not just Magdalena, Isis, all the way back to the root. I followed the root, I tracked it, you know, also with not just in my meditations, but also in the writings that you can find, like if you if you look. And I was like, this is the root lineage of all lineages, if I may be so bold to say that. Um, the mother line, where all springs from. And yet, she has been cemented over. So now we break the cement and liberate, let her liberate and, and come forth. And I, I feel... Um, very inspired about it, um, moved by it, and I feel um, there is so much to speak about. And I know we have a bit of a limited time, but maybe I just read a little piece. I was going to, I think it leads beautifully into, I was going to ask you to, to read, and that would yeah. be fantastic if you read a couple of things that you think are important. And that'll I be just... That's I just whole offering. <laughs> how about I just read two little pieces here? Perfect. Yeah. I'm the dark and the light one. I'm the colors of life, and I'm the mother of all. With loving arms, I sweep through the lands and hearts to take my children home. I weep the tears with those lost and grieving. Your outrage is my fire. I rejoice in the blossoming of the first flowers and burst into pearls of laughter with you. I feed my all my children without exception. I run wild as the lioness through the mountains and valleys. I'm gentle, fierce, untethered in my power. I love my own. I'm the feminine seen in all the faces of those who travel this earth. I breathe the breath of life, the ruach, through you. I'm alive in your belly and whisper and roar as your voice. I say unto you now, for the sake of all beings, awaken from your slumber and rise. And so there was a moment in my journey where I was it um, encountered more of the Magdalena here. Mm -hmm. It was storming and raining. When I arrived in the old Casa lands in France to take shelter in a tiny little chapel on top of a hill, the wooden door creaked and only a few candles were lit. Dim light softly illuminated the exquisite statues and paintings of women, saints, and Mary Magdalena. One man was sitting bowed in the wooden pew, praying. Silence, thick stillness envelop enveloped the air. I joined in meditation, feeling her. 
An hour later, the man turned around and introduced himself to me. We talked about our connection to the Magdalena, and it felt auspicious when he invited me to come to a secret cave, also called the Womb and Birthing Cave of Mary Magdalene. It was a three-hour journey away, somewhere in the mountains, and really hard to find. It's the kind of place you must feel called to and have a guide, a hidden power place, not a spiritual tourist attraction. All hair rose in recognition. Yes, I said excitedly. Was I mad? I shouldn't go with a stranger and a guy I don't know. I already had learned that as a child. But something in me knew that this was right and he was safe. After a long drive and hike, I shivered as I faced the entrance, which was beyond anything I had ever seen. She beckoned me to enter through the enormous yoni-shaped rocks and slide down on my butt into the sacred womb cave. It was in the steps of darkness where I sat for days, where she revealed herself, the way of the feminine, so different than what we have shown and been taught. That, my friend, is a beautiful place to pause. Yeah. Magnificent. When uh, could you give us some? Um, your book is out now. Yes, it is. Yes, Love Unleashed is out. <laughs> it's time for the Year of the Dragon. It's beautiful. And uh, what is your your website address for people? NicolaAmadora.com. That's pretty straightforward. Nicola. Yeah. I like to keep things simple. You yeah. Know? Yeah. <laughs> And I hope uh, we can talk again. We could go on for hours, but I wanted to make sure that we had a uh, the fullness of of uh, uh, a, 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 a dip into your work. And I think we have we have that. And I'm I think so too. For your time, this is our first online interview, the lodge's first online interview in a series. So. Thank you. Oh, for... how beautiful. Oh, I'm so honored. Thank yeah. you so very much. It's such a joy to actually be part of this and especially Theosophical Society is dear in my heart too. So thank you. We'll be, we'll be in touch and thank you all for joining us. And this, uh, uh, Nicole and I are recording this on uh, the morning of, uh, was it the 12th, February 12th? Yeah, and uh, we'll be post close to Valentine's, close to Valentine's, which is literally the love fest. So it's a good time to get a book on there, love. There you go. Get your. Copy. We need more, we need more love in this world for sure. Real love. Get your copy of Love Unleashed, and give it as a gift, and um, this will appear on the Lodge's uh, website, Lodge's uh, YouTube channel, and the Lodge's Facebook uh, Facebook uh, page, and uh, elsewhere in our social media. So um, we'll we'll get the word out. Thank you again for your time. Blessing. Oh, thank you. It was a blessing.